Hi everyone, welcome to Farfight's Newer Tech Group, chaired by Wendell Kuhner. I'm really happy to have so many of you here and also to have seen so many of you at our recent whole brain emulation for AI safety workshop that happened, I guess, about a month ago, so longer. So thanks everyone for joining for that. If you, whether or not you were there, we're currently working on the recordings, which should be published in the next month or so, including the report. And so please stay tuned for that. But that's the only housekeeping I want to do today. With that, without further ado, I'm really, really excited at Jacob Robinson here. And we've actually been, I think, coordinating quite a while for this uh, particular meeting. So thanks a lot for coming on for this. Um, and you're from Rice University, and today you'll be discussing how to treat brain disorders at their source. So thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited for what you have ahead in terms of showing us what you're working on. And I'll be in the chat moderating. I'll be sharing more info about you in the chat as well. And then we'll take it to a Q&A after your presentation. Thanks a lot for coming on, and the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Allison. It's a real pleasure to be here and following some of the work from this group and really excited to see the critical mass of folks coming together in what I think is a really exciting space in, in neurotech. So a, a little bit about myself and what I want to chat with you guys about today. So I'm a professor at Rice. I've been at Rice for about 10 years. My training is in physics. And at some point in my uh, life, I decided that I wanted to see if we could apply physical principles to the understanding of the brain and perhaps how we might be able to treat mental illness. After a few DARPA programs that we were a part of, two brain-computer interface programs, NSD and NQ, one was a high bandwidth brain-computer interface, the other was a non- and minutely invasive brain-computer interface, we had developed a technology that I was really excited about that, my, that I thought was like the platform that could allow us to finally have this interface of the brain. So I took a professional leave of absence last year, and I started a company called Motif Neurotech, which is what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today. So I kind of wear two hats. One is the academic side. I can't really escape it. A little bit of a physicist by training, so I apologize if there's a little bit of physics talk in here. And what I really want to focus on is this translation from technology developed in my lab at Rice to how we might be able to create a product that survives on the market as a brain-computer interface for mental health disorders. Also, we can keep this casual. I will also look at the chat. And if you guys want to stop me at any point, I'm happy just to chat with you guys. So I don't want to keep this super formal if you guys want to jump in. The story begins with why this company exists. So I told you my personal background. I'm a physicist interested in the brain, but the company exists in part because when we look at neurological disorders across the spectrum, about a third of people fail to respond to drugs. And in some cases, there are no drugs that work for them at all. So if we look at depression, PTSD, ADHD, Alzheimer's disease, any number of conditions, there's about one in five Americans that suffer from a mental health disorder and about a third of those fail to respond. And part of why we think that drugs really struggle is that we know now from neuroscience that many of these disorders are network level disorders. What I mean by that is that there are regions of the brain that become active or inactive depending on your mental state. If your state of rumination or anxiety or depression from things like fMRI or FNIRS, we can see different patterns of activity emerge in the brain. Now, when we suffer from something like depression, we see this brain state emerge, this inactivity in certain parts of the brain. And so the thought is, maybe we could build an interface that addresses what is fundamentally a network at that level of individual brain areas that we could stimulate and record to play patterns of activity to restore healthy functions of brain patterns of activity or motifs. And if we think about it from this standpoint, it's an engineering problem, right? This is a complex dynamical system. Drugs act indiscriminately on these receptors, not just in the brain, but throughout the bottom throughout the body. And that's often what leads to the side effect profiles. So in some ways, the vision of the future is that we start to interact with brain networks and stop treating these as just drugs that act indiscriminately. And to set the stage for why I think this is an important need and also where I think we might begin, we started thinking about who are the people who would be most, who would benefit the most from surgical solution or a network or a BCI for mental health. And those are the people who suffer from treatment-resistant depression. So you guys may know every year, about 3 million people fall into a major depressive episode and don't respond to their antidepressants. It's every single year, about 3 million Americans. This is treatment-resistant depression group has very high suicide rates. And 
about a third of people attempt suicide once in their lifetime who suffer from this condition. So it's an extreme level of need. And I think we can think about this abstractly. I can tell you 3 million and 30%, but I think it's really more powerful to hear from the voices of the people themselves. I recently was talking to Helen Mayberg and she was on a podcast and spoke to John Nelson, who had a deep brain stimulator implanted for depression. And I think it's really powerful to hear his story of kind of what led him to that decision. It's, it's been an amazing ride for me through this journey. Being stuck so sick for so long and not really being able to talk about it just exacerbated the disease and trying to stay alive and trying to continue to fight for treatments and nothing worked was my reality. Most people with major depressive disorder, that is the reality is you got two options. You're either going to stick through it, suffer in misery, or you're going to take your own life. And those are the two options. That's when you're a treatment resistant person, that's where you are. And I think I, I get, so I, I get two things actually every time I listen to this. One is like that state of desperation, but you also hear this glimmer of hope, right? He calls it an amazing ride. And that's because there is emerging from science and technology, a way out for these people with treatment resistant depression. You know, it, oops. And that is because we are understanding the circuit better. In many people with treatment resistant depression, it's there's an activity level in their prefrontal cortex, which is diminished. This prefrontal cortex, that's your executive functioning region. It's the region that allows you to motivate yourself to do the things that you know you should be doing to get well. It's the region that tells you, it allows you to motivate yourself to get out of bed in the morning, to take a shower, to work out, to call your friends. And in people with depression, that region is underactive and it's difficult. In fact, you actually, it's almost impossible. John was talking about how he used to love to walk his dog and he just can't, he physically can't get out of bed and walk his dog. And the hope comes from the fact that we can stimulate and reactivate this specific region of the brain. And it is effective for people with treatment resistant depression. And we know that through technologies like transcranial magnetic stimulation. So TMS uses a giant magnet to create an electrical field inside the brain that activates about a centimeter area. And that centimeter area can be targeted to that prefrontal cortex to increase its activity. And in fact, if we look at brain scans before and after TMS therapy, that area of the brain is recruited. And if we look at outcomes for people with depression, people who have not responded to drugs, about 50% of them get better and about 30% of them get in, go into remission, meaning they get back to living a normal healthy life. And in fact, it works so well that it's not just cleared by the FDA, but insurance companies will reimburse $15,000 for a course of therapy. But surprisingly, only about 30,000 people a year go through this procedure out of that 3 million that we think could benefit from it. So why hasn't TMS just solved this problem? It's addressing the source, it's addressing the circuit. The problem is that this machine generates about three megawatts of energy in order to stimulate the brain. By way of context, that's enough energy to stimulate 1,500 households, right? So you have this big ass machine. It's not really safe to take that thing home. So you have to drive to a clinic five days a week for six weeks because you need this regular stimulation in order to rebalance that network. Because of that overhead of having a room and a staff um, a course of therapy costs about $15,000. Insurance companies reimburse most of that, but it's about one to $2,000 out of pocket. Now, all this wouldn't be so bad if it lasted. But unfortunately, the median time to relapse is 11 months, which means, imagine, the very people who have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning, getting in the car and going to do the things that they know they need to do in order to get better, we're asking them to drive to a clinic five days a week for six weeks and to do this every single year because the benefit doesn't last. So this is where we thought we had this opportunity. I spent the last 10 years trying to make miniature implants like this. Here's a group of people who are traveling every day to a clinic. We know that the stimulation can work. Can we create a version of this therapy that can be done at home following a minimally invasive implantation procedure? And so the concept that we developed looks like two components. One device, it's about the size of a pea. The other is a baseball cap 
And with a 20 minute outpatient surgery, physicians can make a surgical incision about a centimeter long. They take out a small piece of bone. We put the device in above the dura, never making contact with the brain. We put a cover on top of it and seal it back up. Notice there's no need to shave the head. They just part the hair, make a small incision. And the device itself sits in the skull and it sits in the skull above the brain. Then what you do is you put a baseball cap on that baseball cap communicates with the implant, push a little button on a watch or a phone, and we can play that stimulating pattern of activity that would have been generated by a TMS machine, but in the comfort of your own home. We zoom in on what's happening and electrical activity is activating the neurons beneath that implant, causing them to become more active to allow that executive functioning to be regained. And it actually begins to spread to the network. So that whole network level activity, just like TMS, can be recruited following that same pattern of stimulation. And so what we've done is we basically created this kind of TMS to go like therapy and made it accessible. It's not just the fact that driving to the clinic is challenging. It's also difficult to disseminate this to people who don't live near a clinic, people in rural communities people who are working or taking care of kids that can't afford to take that time off of work, they can now benefit from this therapy. It's also less expensive than two courses of TMS. So that means it's going to be likely covered by insurance companies. So regardless of where you live or how much money you make, you know, how accessible the ability to access what could be this life-saving therapy. And the implantation happens once and then lasts for a decade. So anytime you need to get a maintenance therapy or you might relapse, you put the baseball cap back on, there's no need for additional surgical solution. So that's the vision of what this whole thing would look like. The real details is what I spent the last decade doing. So I'm going to dive a little bit into that. So bear with me here. But to make this all possible, we needed to make an implant that could fit in the thickness of the skull and be about the size of a pea. That's hard. It's hard because most implants require battery power. And that battery takes up a huge volume. So if I think about other implants like pacemakers, there's a little battery pack in the chest that goes to the wires. Most of that battery pack is the volume needed to house the battery itself, right? The electronics can be small. And what we realized is that if we could remove the battery, and have just off-the-shelf electronic components and figure out a way to deliver energy wirelessly, effectively through the body, we could make, really change the paradigm for how implants are manufactured in the architecture. So we've created these battery-free devices using a material that we spent the last 10 years developing in my lab at Rice. And this material is, is a magnetoelectric material. It's okay, sorry, apologize, physics time. So how do we power devices in the body? Typically, we use things like inductive coupling. So inductive coupling is how you charge your AirPods on the power mat. It's how you charge your iPhone. It works fine for big devices. The problem is that the amount of energy I get depends on the area of this receiver squared. So as I make small devices, they don't get a lot of power. In fact, if I plot inductive coupling as a function of power I receive versus the size of my receiver, I just don't get that much energy. It's about 10 milliwatts but I need more to stimulate the brain effectively. Now, the material that we've developed transfers energy from magnetic field by, by vibrating in the presence of this alternating field. So this mechanical vibration can be turned into electrical energy through a piezoelectric effect that is much more efficient at these small scales. So if I plot now how much energy we are getting, these little black splats or whatever have five to 10 times more energy. So it was this kind of insight that led to the ability to create devices the size of a P and still have enough energy to stimulate the brain. And it's not just that the energy is high. We also needed to have this really great misalignment tolerance, meaning that I can move my device relative to my transmitter and still transfer energy. If you guys have power mats at home, I do. So I would say probably like one out of 10 nights, I like put my phone slightly misaligned on the little power mat and I wake up and I'm like, my battery's dead. Oh, why didn't it charge? It's this misalignment tolerance that is really sensitive in inductive coupling. And we don't have that because of the nature of the wireless power transfer here. So not only do we get power, 
we get the ability to power regardless of how I put on that headset. So with those two features combined, we have the core technology, which allows me to begin to envision what this network level interface might look like, starting with a single spot above the prefrontal cortex. A little bit more about how this thing works. We can send not just energy, but also data to this device. And what we'll do is we'll program it using this headset to the right simulation values. So meaning that a doctor might prescribe a particular dose level. We program that with the headset. We can also receive data from the implant that would allow us to track neural activity. Why do we want that? Let's get here. The ability to measure neural activity unlocks a really unique feature that we really don't have in mental health care at the moment. In fact, I'll let one of our psychiatrists describe this in a minute, but one of the challenges that we've discovered in talking to patients and clinicians is that when people are struggling with a mental health condition, they don't always know if they're getting better. They don't always know if they're getting worse. For example, they come home one day and they don't feel good. Is that because there's something that you know, bad happened to them that day, or are they falling into a clinical depression that might lead them to suicidal ideation? They don't know until they're already at the rock bottom. And the idea that they might be able to know ahead of time was incredibly powerful for them. With the ability to measure neural data, we hope to be able to develop those types of biomarkers. And I'll let Dr. Cousin talk about how important it is to be able to track objectively, not just based on feedback, how people are doing. I'll play this for a second here. If I had a relapse marker, um, I would just half of my job would be gone. And tracking down the patients at the clinic because they call you when they're, and then they stop calling you when they're either doing phenomenally well or they're in bed and they can't pick up the phone. And I don't know which one is which. I don't care about the gray area in the middle. I have patients who don't call, don't show up for appointments, and I don't know if they're doing well, living their lives and going to Bermuda or in bed planning how to kill themselves. And that's not a good place to be. If everybody that doesn't show up, I don't know. If I call, and if I call and they don't answer, what do we do? Do we keep calling them? Do we send the police? For me, a biomarker of some sort that indicates relapse would be terrific. Now we don't have these biomarkers yet, in part because no one's been able to measure from a large a group of people over an extended period of time what the activity of their brain is doing while they are simultaneously tracking their mood scores. And what I like to imagine is that with something that's delivered therapeutically, there's an incentive for the patient to continue with that therapy to wear their hat because they're receiving benefit. And because we'll have this group of patients who are continual users, we'll be able to collect data and over time develop the biomarkers that could be true generally, but also individualized for the individual patient. Your biomarkers might be slightly different and they can train them on, on your patterns of brain activity. There's evidence to suggest that this is really feasible because new data from deep brain stimulation has shown that there are patterns of brain activity that do predict in advance within a couple of weeks prior to relapse when that patient is going to relapse. So we have these early indicators that are beginning to be developed based on small patient studies. So I think there is a real opportunity for us to combine not just therapeutic simulation, but the early alert warning systems here. If I had the... Oops. Okay. The other thing that I think was important for me when I was looking at the landscape of neurotech and thinking about how this might be deployed is the fact that there are very few people in the country who actually do functional neurosurgery. So functional neurosurgery means that they're planning where in the brain they're going to place something that can stimulate your core brain activity. It's a special training program in addition to being trained as a neurosurgeon. And across the United States, there's only about 250 people who are trained in functional neurosurgery. And this is a real problem to think about ever deploying this type of therapy at scale. And it's a problem actually for any kind of brain computer interface company thinking about deploying at scale. In fact, this is why Neuralink built a robot. Right. They're like, dude, there are not enough surgeons to give everybody a brain implant. So they're going to build a robotic neurosurgeon, essentially. Our thought is that rather than trying to create 
a robotic version of neurosurgeons, we can create a device that can be implanted using existing surgical approaches that are easier to perform by the vast majority of neurosurgeons that are already trained for these procedures. So the procedure that we would be using relies on a relies on a standard 14 millimeter perforator. And this is used 200,000 times a year, can be done in an outpatient facility and eventually at a bedside or an ablatory surgical center. And the number of people who are qualified to do this is about 10 times the number of functional brain surgeons. So I think the vision is that we take existing surgical tools, existing surgical facilities, existing surgeons who are trained on these tools, and we give them the power to implant functional neurostimulation and recording devices that match the geometry of the existing infrastructure. So that's what I've been thinking about in terms of taking an idea of building a tiny implant, how we might be able to reach the patient population, how we can fit within ex existing distribution pathways. The question that I often get asked, or I ask myself, you should be asking, is that this is a wild claim, right? I told you at the beginning, there's three megawatts of energy to stimulate the brain, right? 1,500 households being condensed into one very fast magnetic pulse. And here I am telling you that a baseball cap can do the same thing with battery power that's about one watt, so less than the energy used to power a light bulb. So a million times less energy from this device can do the same thing that the TMS device can do. Now, the physics works, right? It works because we're creating an electrical stimulation below this implant rather than using this weird magnetic to electric field conversion. But it's not, I don't know. I think it's, a, so I believe in physics. So I think this is enough. When I was going out raising money, people were like, prove it, right? Show me that this actually works. So this is what we spent the last year or so in the company trying to demonstrate that this device does the same thing that TMS can do. Now, the way that we did this is we asked, how do people that work with TMS, how do they know what's working? So they know what's working by, the, by taking this coil, putting it over the motor cortex, the part of the brain that's associated with movement, and they turn it up until you start to move someone's fingers. And that's what this looks like over here. So this is someone's thumb moving, right? TMS is turned up and they're like, okay, that's motor threshold. Everything from that point forward is based on that motor threshold number. They'll move to the prefrontal cortex. They'll do 80% motor threshold. So what we wanted to ask is, could our device, even though it's so tiny and powered by a watt, reach motor threshold? So we went into the OR, we placed this device above motor cortex, handed it over to a neurosurgeon, which is a big leap of faith for us because they've never touched this thing before. And we're like, okay, here, put this in over motor cortex, put a little coil over it power it and see if you can get someone's fingers to move. Can you reach motor threshold? And this is it for the first time, our intraoperative study. You can see this person's hand contracting. So it's moving every time we stimulate from this implant in the same way that we can move someone's finger with TMS. And so the, for the first time, we have this minimally invasive, this kind of millimeter-sized wireless battery-free implant generating enough energy to stimulate someone's hand in the way that TMS can. We then took a step further and we um, implanted this chronically in a pig. You can see the surgical preparation here, just like that video I showed you, sewed it back up, stimulating from above the dura, remember no contact with the brain. And then we went in every day for 20 days, got these little pigs to take a nap on our lap, not me, I had Amanda and the team do it, but these pigs took a nap on our lap, put a little coil on top, powered the implant and can move that pig's arm just like TMS can stimulate motor cortex. So from this, we've developed the working principle. I want to just mention a little bit about where I think this kind of fits into the workflow. So today, when someone sees their psychiatrist, the psychiatrist gets paid from their insurance companies or it's out of pocket. About half of psychiatrists get paid without insurance reimbursement. The psychiatrist then writes a prescription and sends that patient to the pharmacist. The patient then pays that pharmacist, usually from their insurance or potentially out of pocket. Pharmacist pays wholesale for those drugs that they sell. Now, what we're proposing is that we create basically that same workflow, but for an electronic medicine. So the referral goes out this time, not to a psychiatrist, but to a surgical facility. They perform that one time outpatient procedure. And then that patient comes back and they be, work with their psychiatrist, just like they were getting a med check, they would come and get an electronic med check. And this is, I think, an interesting paradigm because TMS 
is not just being used to look at depression, but because we can enroll patients in ways that we've never been able to enroll them before, we're learning about how we can stimulate the brain for PTSD, chronic pain, addiction, TBI, anxiety, all ADHD, and Alzheimer's disease in ways that really were not possible. Because if we look historically, these have been done with invasive implants, and it's really difficult to enroll patients in those trials. But because TMS is not invasive, we can enroll people in these trials, understand where to stimulate, how to stimulate, how to look at outcomes, how to select patients. And all of that now is taking off like a rocket ship, not just for one indication, but perhaps across the indications. Now, the one thing that TMS always struggles with is providing long lasting at home solutions. So TMS will be able to help us understand the science behind where and how to stimulate and we hope to be able to take that idea and translate it into the households for people who don't necessarily live near clinics and want to have the benefit for a long period of time. So I think broadly at the landscape, the dream is that we start to think about mental wellness and mental illness in the same way that we think about cardiovascular disease or pain, right? We have implants when drugs don't work. And even when drugs sometimes do work, we don't like the side effects, right? No one really thinks twice if your cardiologist says, hey, you should get a pacemaker. And I think that there is a future coming where we won't think twice when the psychiatrist says, look, your ADHD medication keeps you up at night. You suffer insomnia. It's not really working for you. But 20-minute outpatient thing at the ambulatory surgical center will help get you back to your normal, to a neurotypical state. It'll be under your control of the push of a button, and you won't suffer the side effects you have from your disorder. Now, it's a little bit futuristic to think about things like ADHD, but I think that's not, once things become normalized, it's really not that different from jamming wires in your heart for a cardiac pacemaker. In fact, it's much less invasive and less dangerous to do something like this. But of course, starting with something that's life threatening, like depression, I think is the right way to go. We got here over a long time. I tell the story fast, right? It's been like 30 minutes. You can even check your emails. This has been 10 years for us. And it started with hand soldered things in my lab at Rice, moving into Things that look a little bit more sophisticated in large animal preparations. We publish this in the academic literature, but it's only over this last year that things really started to take off because it's like, we need to take this out of the lab. We need to get it in the OR. We need to get it funded like a commercial venture so that we can hire the team around us to really build a medical device. And we were just getting started, but we had that first human demonstration that we got just after, uh, I guess, just last month. And so where we're heading is... After we've demonstrated what I showed you today, which is that the device technically it works, it stimulates the brain, not just in humans, but over a long period of time in pigs, we hope to find, we're actually raising around right now to start a clinical trial. So by 2025, we hope to see the therapeutic response of this device in a patient population. So really the first miniature neural stimulation implant in a, a mental health indication. I am, as I mentioned, an academic by training. And so I usually end with like acknowledgements. And this is so true also in a commercial venture, right? We came into this with a little bit of knowledge about wireless power transfer and some physics and how I believe we can miniaturize things, maybe address networks. But it really takes a team effort with folks that don't just understand kind of the physics, but also the surgeons. So I'm here, Shet is a functional neurosurgeon, the co-founder of the company. Sunil does minimally invasive surgical procedures. And then we had to partner with folks from Medtronic and Boston Scientific and BlackRock in order to really understand what it takes to build a med device company that's going to get all the way through FDA approval and into that clinical trial by 2025. So I've been really fortunate to have those partners as well as the full-time employees that have joined Motif just over the last year, as well as the interventional psychiatrists who share the perspective of what it's like to actually work with the patients in need. Like I said, casual, it's very new. We started this company about 16 months ago, so I still keep track in months or not two. I feel like at two, and then you start keeping track by years. But I would love to have you guys along for the ride and questions you have, I'm happy to entertain them. If you want to follow along, we have a website, a newsletter, and you can follow us on the social. But that was my high level run through what it is that we're working. Thank you guys for your time. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This was, yeah, quite mind boggling. I'm going to stop sharing your screen if you don't mind. Thank you. This was really great. And you have a ton of questions already bubbling up in our meeting chat. Is it okay if I take them already? Do you prefer a quick break? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're ready for the roll? Okay. Then we start with Micah, then Randall, then Tomo, and then we'll see where we end up. Thanks.
this question is probably academic for many of the people in this room, so please don't spend a lot of time on it. I'm just wondering, do, you, do we know what the mechanism is that makes it so an electric field will cause neurons to be stimulated? Like what is happening there? Again, a short, the short version, cartoon version as it were. Yeah, thank you for that, Micah. I never know what level to communicate at. The mechanism of action to stimulate neurons with an electric field is very well understood. So all neurons have ion channels or little, little gates that open up when there's an electric yep. across them. And so all we're doing is we're activating those voltage-gated channels. It's very similar to what happens when they receive input from other neurons. So these channels open up, the cell creates a very rapid electrical impulse. That information then travels down its axons to the adjacent neurons. And that's how we actually activate the network. So even though we're coming in at one spot, that electrical energy creates that nerve impulse, propagates through the network and engages that entire network associated with that executive functioning. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Randall, you're next. Thank you. Hi, that was really awesome. I'm very curious about the how well these sort of keyhole surgeries, how they turn out and whether the patients experience any kind of issues over time, the rate is of that. Because I'm also wondering, this totally makes sense for patients who are suffering badly. Uh, but at some point, you start to wonder, the same sort of technology, could it be used for other purposes? There's therapeutic, of course, but what if there are other uses that maybe even healthy people would want to use them for, which is like heresy. You don't go there right now. You don't say that to the FDA, but it's a question on my mind. I love this question. And I've thought a lot about it. The surgery itself is incredibly common and safe. So 200,000 times a year, people are doing this. It's an auto-stopping drill. I don't know if I mentioned that, but basically you turn it on, you push down, and it automatically stops at the bottom of the skull. It doesn't, and in fact, it leaves behind a little layer of bone, so it never touches a soft tissue. And if you keep pushing on it, nothing happens, right? So we've done some of these things, obviously, in in the OR and the animal studies. And one day, Samir, our neurosurgeon, was out of town, and so Sunil, if he's a doctor, a neurologist, doesn't do these kinds of things. Was like, sure, I'll do it. It's as idiot proof as you can from a surgical standpoint. Perfect. I just pushed it down and stopped. He takes it out, dropped it in. Okay. So to back up, and you can do this without general anesthesia, you can do it under sedation. So if I look at procedures like LASIK, like I think there is a point in time when LASIK looks more scary than this, right? Where getting your wisdom teeth out is more intimidating than this. So from a surgical standpoint, I do think there's an opportunity that there where a future is, yeah. I could really benefit from this. Now, the question of healthy individuals versus medical application is really interesting. The way that I think about it is I bring up ADHD because I actually think that this is a really interesting use case. I have a mental health startup company, so I have to be more transparent. So I suffer from ADHD and it's in my family. And I did to get prescribed medication and it did cause insomnia and I had to go off of it. And it was really frustrating. It was really frustrating because I wasn't able to be as present at home. My mind always working in the background. I just, I'm like, I wish I could just push a button and focus. And if you think about that, you know, it's almost like an electronic Adderall without side effects. And so then where I could see it going is that there's a lot of people who suffer from conditions like ADHD, not exactly neurotypical. I see this always as a prescription option, but a prescription option that is as prevalent as Adderall or any other kind of stimulant. So I, I see very long time, maybe healthy individuals opt into it, but I think actually in the not so distant future, it becomes a widely used electronic medicine. Possibly with fewer side effects. It's Much fewer side effects. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Because you're targeting the regions of the brain that are important. You don't have the side effects. And that's what limits a lot of people from staying on their medication. It's not that it's often not that the medications don't work. It's often that the side effects are so unbearable that you can't reach a therapeutic dose is what changes. Wow, that's really great to hear. The next one we have Tomo. Yep. Yeah. My first question is just to clarify, the device sits on top of a thin layer of bone as opposed to direct, directly on the brain. Is that correct? So not exactly. Okay, so you do both. So what happens, maybe I'll actually... If I have a week. There is a slide here that will show. But the surgical, yes, there is. Can I show this one? Yeah. 
So let me show you what the oh wrong one. All right, so let me show you what the procedure looks like. So this is the auto stopping drill. This is not our video, right? This is a FDA approved surgical tool called a perforator. It drills into the bone here and it stops at the base of the skull automatically. And it leaves a little ledge that prevents you from pushing it any further. Okay. But what it leaves behind is a small, is a thin layer of bone. The tool itself never touches the dura. And what you do is you take that small piece of bone out. And now what's exposed is not the brain. It's a piece of tissue called the dura that actually protects the brain from the skull. Yeah. So it'll be placed there about a millimeter or two above the brain, never touching the surface of the brain. With the skull, is it not conductive enough if you make it thin enough that you can put the implant in the bone as opposed to all the way under the up on top of the dura or? Yeah. So I, I, there's a company who's trying to do something like this. There's a lot of challenges from an engineering and a surgical standpoint. For one, the tools don't exist to drill partway through the skull. So you'd have to create a new surgical tool. Secondly, the bone continues to regrow. So over time, that will actually push your implant up and you'll have a bump on your head. You want to have it completely invisible once it's implanted. And then two, it actually puts you farther away from the surface of the brain. You need more energy. You need more energy. Now you have less volume to work with. Because now I've been on a device even thinner than the skull. So now I only got a couple of millimeters to work with. So there's just a number of engineering challenges that make that, I think, an impractical approach for a small marketing benefit of saying that we're not drilling all the way through. Okay. I was thinking more of the, the difficulty of surgery because the auto drill itself seems to get me do the part of thin enough bone. And then obviously, yeah, it depends on the marketing, as you said. Yeah, for me, like I was thinking, if it's, you're, we're just shaping off bone as opposed to we're opening all the way to the dura, I think the impression people might get and the adoption might be, yeah, slightly different. But again, yeah, I, the engineering might have, would be too difficult. But so then how much of the brain is actually stimulated in terms of volume? So TMS is known for poor resolution and that's usually how people bash it and then TACS is even worse but sometimes like in NHP optophys literature it's actually found that if you want to have a effect you have to have a fiber optic that is shaved off at various places so you stimulate a larger volume as opposed yeah. to a small volume it affects local neurons but it's not enough to drive behavior so stimulation volume slash also is it possible to have a two pole system. So you have maybe two distal parts and you pass current through them. Yeah. So I think there's a couple answers to this. So actually there are three questions. So one was the adoption question, which I'm just going to touch on slightly. I agree with you from a marketing standpoint. Yeah. Shaving is probably better adoption, but I think that's often missing the broader point, which is that what is, what I believe is going to drive adoption based on our interviews of patients and clinicians is efficacy. If I could come to, and it's important to think about the people that we're talking to, right? The people who suffer from a serious mental health condition. If you can go to them and say, this is going to work for you in one week, you're going to experience remission and I have 80% chance that that's going to happen. It's going to be an implant without brain surgery. The key aspect is how effective it's going to be. So I think if we drive the efficacies at TMS levels, particularly things like accelerated TMS that we're starting to see, then that's what's going to drive adoption much more so than saying, oh, there's a millimeter of bone or not a millimeter of bone at the very bottom. Okay. The second thing is related to the volume of excitation, like how vocal are we the same? That's why I really liked this study because we know that from TMS, we're activating enough motor cortex to get a digit in this case, the thumb to move. And when we crank ours all the way up, we can get an entire hand to contract, right? So we can get even a larger volume of tissue. And what we can do is we can turn that down to get individual digit level activation. And so you're right. Like if I want to stimulate an individual neuron that has almost no behavioral output, 
you really need to recruit a larger volume. And that's why we took this approach versus a Neuralink approach where I want to have a individual neurons. That's cool if you want to create a percept. But if you actually want to recruit enough tissue to have a therapeutic effect from a neuromodulation standpoint, you actually want a larger volume. And that's what we're getting here is that comparable volume TMS as we see based on how much motor cortex we're recruiting. Okay. There's another point I want to bring up too. I didn't include necessarily in this deck, but part of the vision of Motif is that I mentioned at the beginning that these are networks, right? What I'm describing right now is an interface to one node in that network. Where I think the future lies is multiple implants at distributed brain areas. So you can get broader coverage, not necessarily with high resolution in each one of those coverage in each one of those sites, because that's not what we really need for therapies. What we really want is I want bilateral prefrontal cortex. And maybe I want something more over some of the brain areas in the back associated with kind of cognitive function and memory. And that might be a more powerful interface than having a lot of channels into one small region of the brain. And that's where I think we would be going to address this question of I really want to get a little bit more fine tuning about how I'm stimulating. I think it's with a distributed network. I see. Yeah. The cortex does have some relatively well-known targets, but how small can this be made and would it be practical as an implant as well? Not having to have weeds come out that maintain contact is probably nice. And if it, the energy transmission distance is large enough, there might be other things for PTSD. If something like amygdala might be a bit more of a, or habenula might be a bit more of a direct target and might get results quicker. So are there plans to try to move towards that as well? Yeah, we are investigating how we might achieve deeper stimulation, but, but I want to avoid going through the dura. I think once you do that, you enter a different surgical, young girl, yeah. functional neurosurgery. And I think there are, there's a path to get deep stimulation from cortical devices. I would say that. Okay. Yeah. I'm guessing if you have to like a sender and a receiver and you basically have it in the target or some yeah. sort of array format. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's exactly where we'd like to go to hit those deeper targets. I think there, there is this advantage of staying above the dura. And exactly with the network, I think these things can be possible. Yep. I see. Okay. Wonderful. Yep. Is that in case? Oh, Tomo, you have anything further to add? I think that's or, it. You... <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Sorry. Right now, we... I don't know if that's new or new. Uh, yes. Yeah. We have Micah again. The human body tends to not like foreign objects embedded in it and it does lots of things to get rid of them. Is there any risk of long-term rejection or things building up around it or immune response to having this just sitting there? And are there well-known strategies for dealing with that? Yeah, great point. So the materials that we're using are standard materials for chronic implants. We have an advantage of being above the dura in that we don't really have the glial response you would get from intracortical electrodes that tend to encapsulate devices. Now we could have a, fi a fibrous kind of response, but we're already generating enough energy to stimulate through the dura and the CSF. So even if we have a little bit of encapsulation of the implant, the amount of energy that we're generating is already pretty beefy and has similar electrical properties to the dura actually. So in, in some way, we're already designing the implant to stimulate through what the encapsulating material will be. The chronic yeah, pits are good, so I think that's... Go ahead. And those reactions you're describing aren't harmful to the person anyway, right? There's not a risk of immune response or anything. It's just the wrapping and bundling. Yeah, exactly right. There's a minor infection risk, which happens with any kind of surgery, typically around 1%. That can be treated with antibiotics and would not affect the brain because we're not penetrating through the, that protective membrane, that dura. So any infection would be superficial at the scalp. The other thing is that because we're not going into the brain, explantation is super easy. You basically make that same incision, you pull the device out from that hole. So about a 20 minute explantation procedure as well, if you ever needed to take the device out for whatever reason. Excellent, thanks. Okay, unless someone stops me, I'm gonna ask a few of the general software questions that people are always interested in across audition groups. Number one is if you could map out, if this was, really successful in let's say the next five to 10 years or something, where could you see this 
be headed. And I know that I don't like to speculate, but you know, with that preamble in place, if you gave yourself a little bit of leeway to like at least lift your gaze a little bit of what's possible, where do you think this could be going if everything goes well in the next five to ten years? Yeah, I think I alluded to it a little bit with Randall's question. I think it it could be an electronic alternative to what are kind of, in my opinion, shitty mental health drugs, right? Like the side effects that we see from stimulants or, or SSRIs and SNRIs are awful. And the idea that we can begin to act directly on those circuits, be more effective without the side effects, I think that's like broadly applicable to the point where even if you're looking at ways to be a little bit more focused, a little bit more alert, having that kind of tool available to you, I can see that even entering into this quasi-commercial market where maybe it's a prescription, but it's a prescription that's pretty easily obtainable. One way to think about this is that, I'm going to speculate wildly here. So if you think about a lot of the things that we do on a daily basis are affecting our, the network states of our brain. I have probably had like two cups of coffee today, tonight, I'm probably going to have a drink or two. There are all these things that we are trying to do to regulate our brains using really crappy ways with small molecules that have all these other kinds of side effects. Now, imagine for a moment that you had the ability to regulate that with the push of a button that could be scheduled and you could add the ability to monitor, to have a Fitbit for your mental health. Those kinds of things are really not that improbable. They're all about measuring and manipulating brain states electronically. Wonderful. I love that. I also really like that you pointed out the more potential newer biomarkers and the, the real need for that. And we have the same in our biotech and longevity group, even though people are, let's say, perhaps a little bit further along, but there's still not really like consensus on like which biomarkers to use. It's just, it's difficult. It's hard. Okay, wonderful. One more question would be more on, do you think that there's any kind of upcoming challenges, like to the extent that they could be twofold, like one here, let's say ethical or like just challenges where you're like, oh, I'm not really quite sure how we're going to deal with this particular bit down the road in terms of like policy, regulation or so forth. Or the other bit could just be a technical challenge. So let's say someone new was entering the field and really wanted to contribute. What would be one thing that you would point them to where they could really solve a few of the things that provide headaches for you and when you think yeah. about the long-term progress in the future? Yeah, I think the ethical piece is really important. This idea of having like electronic Adderall creates all kinds of like weird scenarios where you create disparities between people's performance based on financial means potentially. I think we address a lot of these things already in pharmaceuticals, but it's a little bit different here. We're thinking about electronic versions of pharmaceuticals, about the side effects. Maybe it's harder to regulate or regulate it differently. I am concerned that what we're using could be used for, in some cases, enhancement, and that it would not be accessible or yeah, accessible to everybody. And it could be abused. So those are things that we have to work on. I think it's a great time to be thinking about policies to address that before the technology is available. Uh, from a technical standpoint, I think that there's gosh, so many things. We don't- The rest of the laundry list. Yeah, yeah. I think there's some basic science that needs to be done. When you look at the history of neuromodulation, we often go forward when we have therapies that are effective and we don't know why they work. So deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease, we don't really have a good sense of why that works. It does. We thought that it was like some kind of an electronic lesion. Turns out that's wrong, even though that's what they use to get justification. Then they're like, maybe it's like an information lesion. That's probably not true either. So there's a lot of basic science that we don't really understand. I would say that's probably true of the mechanisms for TMS. We know it improves excitability in the prefrontal cortex. We don't know why or how. I think understanding that is going to be really important for us to develop next generation therapies. So the mechanism of action challenge is enormous. And I think the other is the biomarkers. So fascinating. I don't think we've had the tools to measure neural activity over an extended period of time from a large patient population. And that's going to change technologies like ours and others that are coming out. There's a right field for people who are interested in mining this data and understanding 
biomarkers that could be generalized as also as well as biomarkers that might be individualized. I think it's a super fascinating area for on the data sciences and machine learning to collaborate with neurotechnology folks. Very cool. And now that we're in the fi final minute, the last but not least question is, if people are interested in helping you in particular along with Motive, then how could they find out more and what are like the initial pain points? I think you already mentioned that you're currently fundraising. So anything that would be useful and like actionable, all these people know now is a great time to share it. Thank yeah. Yeah. So we just kicked off our seed raise. It's a $15 million round and very quickly we are in diligence with a few funds. We're always looking for more folks who would be interested in, in either joining that journey or they know people who would be interested in investing in this space. I would love to talk to them. And we have just added a newsletter to our website. If you want to stay in, in touch, usually when I give these talks, there's one or two people who have family members that they think might benefit. And they just want to kind of keep tabs on what we're doing. I, we plan to have a newsletter out that will help people stay in touch. If you're interested, if you maybe have folks who want to stay in touch, sign up on the newsletter there. I have my email contact as well. Shoot me an email if you want to chat about what we're doing. And if you think there might be investor, investor groups or talent that would be interested in joining us. Cool. I just signed up to your newsletter. Very exciting. <laughs> No, seriously, about, yeah, I don't think anyone here in this room has no one in their immediate family or friend circle who couldn't benefit from this, almost. I would put money on that. And so thanks a lot for doing the work that you're doing and for sharing it. And I think, it, yeah, just it sounds extraordinarily exciting, I think. And just, yeah, like a really big step forward for many people that could benefit from this tech. So thanks a lot for joining. Thanks, everyone, for your great questions. And I'll see you all very soon.